Terry. I'm a member of the congregation, and we're thrilled today to have Vanessa with us. I joined a Pilates class a couple years ago. Our instructor is back here, Sally. And the first thing somebody told me when I walked through the door is, do you know Vanessa Harwood is in this class? And talk about intimidating. That is not something you should tell somebody when they're starting a Pilates class. But she's always been so gracious to all of us. Sally will all can point to her and say, look at Vanessa in her swan pose. Um, and it's, it's such an honor to know her. She was born in England. She was raised in Toronto. She attended the National Ballet School and graduated in 1964. In 1965, she joined the National Ballet. She became a principal dancer in 1970, and she had that role until she left in 1987. For the last 12 years, she's been working, working, yes, having fun as a photographer, <laughs> and she makes the most beautiful gift cards, and she's brought some of them today for sale. They're, I think, $5? So please look at those before you leave. They really are beautiful. She's also brought two of her tutus from her dance days and her point shoes that you can look at after the presentation. I don't want to say more than that because she's going to talk about her long career, but there's one thing she may not mention. If you notice on, oh, it disappeared. Um, there are the letters OC after her name. That doesn't stand for Orange County. <laughs> In 1984, she was the recipient of the Order of Canada Award, and it's a very prestigious award. It's for outstanding achievement, dedication to the community, and service to the nation. And it's quite an honor. She was, I don't think she was gonna tell you that. <laughs> so anyway, please welcome Vanessa. Welcome everyone. Now, I'm just going to say, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes, in the back. Can everybody hear me in the back? Great, because these are, this is right here, so. Um, so welcome to ladies and gentlemen. Welcome my ladies from the exercise class, and welcome if there are any husbands that belong to the exercise <laughs> class. <laughs> I'm impressed if you're here. <laughs> anyway, um, that was a, a very nice little precise uh, pricey of my life, and now I will fill in some of the spaces. I was, as, as Terry said, I was born in England. My parents uh, met in a factory in Cheltenham during the war, and uh, <clears throat> her, my mother's two first boyfriends were, were killed because they were RAF pilots. So when she met my father, she was happy because he worked in a factory and he couldn't go actually to war because he was an engineer. So anyway, they got married there, the war finished, and uh, things were pretty rough in England in those days. And my father said, there's so much more opportunity in Canada. There's jobs, there's all kinds of wonderful things there. Let's go. And my mother said, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's sort of the only um, thing he did on the spur of the moment in his whole life, which was to come to Canada. So we did, we immigrated to Canada in 1951, and unfortunately, couldn't get a job right away. So we actually lived in a little cottage up on Lake Wilcox, and literally, we're all, we were almost starving. But, you know, my mom was making potato dinners for as best as she could. So, uh, but then he did get a job because he was actually very good at what he did and he worked ever, ever since. And one of the things my father did was invented the electrometer, which is the inside of a gyroscope, which went into the first Airbus with Air France. So, and um, my grandfather was also an inventor and he invented the self-winding watch. So that's that side of the family. And my mother was a dancer. She danced in Bristol and then had to give it up when she went to Cheltenham because she couldn't dance there. So when I was here, she used to play me play Swan Lake because she thought I was going to be a dancer. 
So, not that she knew it was a girl, I don't think. But anyway, so, uh, anyway. Oop, did I just? Oh, something happened. Are we good? Okay. We're good. And uh, so we, and we moved to uh, North York. And that's where I took my first ballet lesson with Betty Oliphant in the uh, North York Community Center in the basement. And this is for you, Sally. I'm back in the basement of a church. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I, I sort of liked it, but not really. It was on a Saturday morning, and my friends were playing, and I was going off to ballet school. I was six. And uh, I, I almost stopped. And then Betty Oliphant said, well, when she's seven, she can come down to my studio downtown Toronto. We have bars and proper music, and we have uh, other like-minded students, which is what I did, and, uh, uh, and then that was it. Then I fell in love with ballet, and we used to go to the um, Royal Alexandra Theater, and we used to sit for 50 cents up in the second balcony, and that's how I saw Swan Lake for the first time with Lois Smith. Went backstage, I saw her in her tutu, and that is the Swan Lake tutu right there. And I said, that's what I want to do. And so it was, uh, uh, from there, it was just continuing on, on, on. And then in 1959, Betty Oliphant and Celia Franca started up the National Ballet School. It's called Canada's National Ballet School now. It's got a it's different name. And I was one of the first students. There were 24 of us. And I lived at home at that time. By that time, I was living in Scarborough by the Scarborough General Hospital. If anybody knows that, that when we moved there, Lawrence Avenue was dirt. And there was a bridge on McCowan, which was a single lane wooden bridge. So that, and we were the first subdivision there. So I would travel from there to the National Ballet School every day. I wasn't a, I, I, I didn't board. So that was tough going. And, uh, um, but I was there for, from grade seven. And then I, my teacher in public school was quite good. So I ended up doing grade seven and eight together. So I went into grade nine and by then I was, I guess, 13. And then that's when I did my first performance as a little, I, I looked, I was halfway between a bunny rabbit and a fairy. I don't know, I had, I had ears and I had, I don't know what I was, but it was with the uh, Princess Aurora Sleeping Beauty uh, uh, wedding. And we came out, there were six of us and we did our little thing. And that was my debut in 1960 at the Royal Alex. So then after that, uh, I continued, when, by the time I was 15, so I would have, would have been grade 11, I think, for me. Uh, we, I, they started using some of us in the corps de ballet uh, with the National Ballet at that time. So we, we, were, we filled in. And so really I was doing stuff on stage with the National Ballet at, when I was 15. I graduated from the ballet school grade 12. I was uh, seven. Well, I was 16, then I just turned 17, and then I was going to do an extra year at the ballet school just to, you know, hone up my uh, technique. And I was called into the National Ballet Company to do a solo role because one of the soloists had broken her foot. I mean, I know it sounds like the movies, <laughs> but in fact, that's what happened. And I, t I learned the solo role in two days. And then I flew down to Hartford, Connecticut, and joined the National Ballet on an eight-week, one-night stand all across America by myself, because all my friends were still in the ballet school. And the people that were in the ballet company thought, well, who is this? kid coming in and doing a solo role when I should have probably been doing it before her. So obviously I didn't have very many friends. And I roomed by myself because everybody had been paired up. So it was pretty rough going. And we didn't have cell phones, and, you know, we couldn't phone home. I sent home postcards, but you know, that wasn't 
phone calls. I can only imagine what my mother must have been wondering how I was doing. Anyway, um, but on that tour, I met two dancers and one stagehand. One stagehand made sure I got home every night and that I was safe. And the other two dancers uh, did befriend me. And one of them ended up marrying Ted Neely, who is Jesus Christ Superstar. And when I did get uh, married and have a child, as a matter of fact, we phoned each other and we said, I'm pregnant. She says, I'm pregnant. So we had our daughters within a week of each other, which was really interesting. Anyway, um, I got food poisoning on that tour. And I thought, do I really want to do this? This is, this is really hard. <laughs> anyway. Obviously, I kept on going, and things moved along, and life changed, and I, uh, so that was 1965. By 1970, I was a principal, and I was given Swan Lake to dance. I was given Swan Lake to dance first, my first major role. Most did the Nutcracker, things that they could just sort of ease their way into that weren't so difficult. Swan Lake is like the most difficult ballet. And uh, so I was like pleased as punch. There was this thing that I had seen in my dreams, and here it was. And so I will tell you the story, but eventually I got nicknamed Super Swan. Uh, that's Sleeping Beauty. The pictures here will be uh, random, and you can just look at them, but because um, I don't want to relate to the pictures. So uh, after 1970, Rudolf Nureyev came into our lives in 1972, and it was Sleeping Beauty, and uh, I was chosen to be Aurora with him, and also at that same time I did Swan Lake with him as well. So that was, we were all like, oh my god, ooh, here he comes, you know, he has such a reputation. Well, some of it was true. <laughs> But he was the most exciting thing that had happened to us ever. And one of the things that he did was he made us ballerinas. He said, you're going out there as a ballerina. You're not a schoolgirl anymore. You're not, uh, because as we were brought up as dancers, we were told to be quiet, do what you're told, and, uh, and don't speak up. And he was the opposite. He wanted us to come out and be strong and and be ballerinas, and we were going to be beside him, so he didn't want any little, you know, provincial whatever dancing beside him, so he really inspired us, and so he took us beyond what we thought we could do. And the other thing about Nureyev, although he could, he had a few temper tantrums, and I'll give you a story at the end about one of his temper tantrums, uh, he would always challenge himself to do more than he could do. So we would be, he had these turn, jump turns in a circle in Giselle, and we would be before the second act, and the curtain would be down, and he'd be practicing these jumps in a circle. And he'd be practicing them in an angle like this. And every time we thought, oh my God, he's gonna go over. Oh my God, he's gonna go over. And we think, okay, he's not gonna do them tonight because his, he, he, his angle is bad and he's having trouble with them. No, he always did it. He never, ever gave in to himself. So he taught us to do that, to push ourselves beyond what we thought we could do. And so he, he, he and also he called us his Canadians. He liked us because we weren't bitchy and backstabbing and as some of the people could be in other companies that he had been with. The other thing that he did was he took us to the Metropolitan Opera House and we opened Sleeping Beauty at the Met in 1973 with Rudolph. And that was huge. It was huge for us. It was huge for the National Ballet. It was huge for Canada. And it put us on the map. And he took us. And we would not have gone there without him. So we have that to thank him for. So uh, he danced with us from 73 actually to 80. 81, 82, 
80, 80, no, even longer, 84, so almost over 12 years. So he became part of our company, really. And so over the years, uh, as a, in the company that I was in, which is different than the company now, uh, we created the classics, the Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lake, Giselle, Capelia, Don Quixote, Female Garde, all of those that you probably know better than what they're doing these days. But um, just in the late 80s, we started, the company started to transist into contemporary very slowly. And then, then and now it's, now the ballet is contemporary, modern, classical, you name it. So um, when we were in New York, now I'm going to name drop, okay? Because <laughs> the name dropping is kind of fun. Unfortunately, we didn't have cameras then either for the pictures, so I don't have pictures of any of this. So you have to take my word for it. But um, two things used to happen. When we were in Los Angeles at the Greek Theater, all the movie stars would come to see him. We happened to be there too. <laughs> and uh, uh, so different movie stars would come. Some would come backstage. But anyway, the buzz, Harry Grant was in the audience. Harry Grant, oh my god. <laughs> so uh, the, the, we said, we've got to get him to come backstage after the show. Well, it turns out he's very shy. And so he came back during the intermission. And I had just done uh, Black Swan and changing into the fourth act, because the Greek theater doesn't, we had to do it in four acts because the theater is, doesn't have any uh, feeling. It's open air. So he came back, and I was literally dressed in a towel. And he was with his daughter, Jennifer, and I went, oh, my mother loves you. <laughs> I'm sure now people say that to me. <laughs> it's awful. Anyway, so, um, and that way his daughter was there and he said something like, oh, I just don't know how such a young person could be so talented. I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> and he had come back to see uh, Rudolph. But I said, look, the dancers would just so love to see you. You've got to come back at the end of the show, please. And he said, okay. So he came back and he saw everybody. He was very sweet. <coughs> and then when we were in New York, lots of people came there too to see him, of course. And uh, I was finishing, uh, I think it was Swan Lake, and we were taking our bows, and I looked over into the wing there. It was John Lennon, Yoko Ono, very pregnant with Sean. And he came on and said hello, and you know. A lot of them went off to s speak to Rudolph, but still, we saw. <laughs> I was there too. <laughs> so anyway, that, that, that was there any other? Uh, uh, no, okay, that's enough names for now. And um, the other Russian dancers that I danced with, one was um, Alexander Gudinov, who, who also you probably remember. He he also um, defected, but he defected in in New York and left his wife on the plane, and she went back to Russia and he stayed here. Anyway, he had been working at uh, American Ballet Theater, and uh, Varishnikov uh, threw him out, let him go. And he said, he threw me out like an old potato peel. But it was hard on him. He, he was very upset. But we were from there, we were going on a, a tour of the United States. So we, and there were eight of us. There were just uh, eight dancers. And are you OK? <laughs> you want some water? There's some water over there. And so we traveled all over with him. But he was, uh, he was going through a hard time. And uh, he, his girlfriend at the time was Jacqueline Bissette. So she would, showed up a few times, too. She was lovely. And eventually, at the end of that tour, he actually, this was 1982, he quit. And he stayed in Hollywood with her, and he went into the movies, and he was in Die Hard, and I don't know if anybody remembers a big, tall, blonde guy with his hair flying all over the place. And, uh, and he and it came to a sad end. He drank.
drank a bottle of vodka a day, I think, and died of liver disease at 46 or 7. Like, it was really, really sad. I saw it on the TV, and I was just shocked. I was just shocked. And as for Brizhnikov, I've met him, I've talked to him, I know him, but I've never danced with him. But he, he defected in Toronto, and he did a performance at Ontario Place, and uh, so we all sort of knew him and everything, but he was a bit short. So if I did a knot like this, I would have been, so probably just as well I didn't dance with him. So um, uh, those are the Russians, oh my God. And then the other uh, performer that I danced with was a fellow called Patrick Bissell. He was American Ballet Theater, and he was just, he was kind of a movie star kind of guy, and looked like a football player, really good looking, about six, two or three, like really strong. He used to partner me with one hand sometimes, and his hand was like that. So it was like having two, but he just, you know. And I was doing this step uh, in Romeo and Juliet with him, and I was going around and round, 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 round. And my father was in the audience, and he said, I thought your brakes had failed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and the sad part about that is he was a drug addict, and he EOD'd on a speedball and died when he was about... Uh, I think he was about 32. So drugs are, you know, terrible, terrible things, as we all know. We all know that. So, but it was, uh, at least I had that memory with him, of dancing with him, which was like flying. I would just fly through the air, and he would catch me. And I didn't worry about it. Now, other partners, I would worry. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them weren't quite the same strength. So I would have to be a little bit more careful when I did things. So that, uh, that took us to, then I got married to my husband who is here, Dr. Hugh Scully. We met at a blind date, I won't go into the details. And uh, we got married in 1980, and then I had a daughter in 1984. And that was, there was a big change going on in the ballet at that time. And Eric Brun came in and took over the reins, and he was trying to get rid of the older dancers so he could bring up his younger dancers. So that was the beginning of the end for me. And then I left the ballet company in 87, and, but I continued to dance because I wasn't ready to stop yet. But I was dancing on my terms, not their terms, which was nice. So I was guesting and teaching and doing all kinds of things, but when you're a pr um, principal dancer, you have to stay in principal dancer shape every single day. You have to do your ballet class every single day. You have to rehearse, you have to do it. You can't just go away for a week and then decide to dance again. You have to do it all the time. So to keep that level up at a certain point was, was difficult, and my performances had sort of evened out. But I was almost, I was just bored of short of 45 when I retired, so I actually did really well as a dancer. Because a lot of dancers burn out at 30, depending on if they have injuries or, 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 or whatever. Men, male dancers tend to, their backs go because, and their knees go because they're lifting all the time. And uh, so, and females can last longer. And in today's world, they have more physiotherapy and <laughs> mental therapy. <laughs> they have all these things that can help them now. <laughs> and, um, uh, oh, I did forget to tell you one of the reasons I started dance. My mother said I was pigeon-toed. <laughs> and so then when I finished, I walked like a duck. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, how are we for time? Oh, yeah, we're going. Okay, we're good. One of the things we're going to do is I will continue because I'll go right up to, to um, that's pretty much my career. But one of the things we did in when I was in the company earlier days, we traveled a lot. We went everywhere. We, we traveled in Europe and Mexico, um, all over all over North America, obviously Canada, United States, and every year with the government would pay for us to go 
one way east or one, or one way west every year. So we would do tours like that all the time. They don't, it's too expensive for them to do that now. So, and they also have an opera house, so they do more seasons in, in the opera house. And they do, just now they're starting to travel more. They've just been to Russia and they have been in London and uh, uh, it's interesting that they go, I don't know. But they're going out more than they used to. So now I'll tell the story about Super Swan. We were in uh, Covent Garden in London, 1979, and uh, I shared Swan Lake with Karen Kane. Uh, I shared it with some of the other dancers too, but the two of us did it the most. So I was down to do one Swan Lake, and then there was a mixed program on the Saturday afternoon, and then there was another uh, mixed program uh, Saturday night. Well, uh, Karen Kane had disappeared on, uh, at the beginning of the week in London. Uh, I was left, and then um, Frank Augustine hurt his leg, so my partner was uh, um, uh, uh, Peter Schofus, and he wouldn't come in and do another performance on the Saturday. So uh, they made me do a whole Swan Lake on the Saturday matinee with a different partner. And then I had to come in that night and do the Black Swan Pas de Deux and the third act of Swan Lake in the evening. So I did like three performances in a few days. So they nicknamed me Super Swan. <laughs> and then after that, Karen Kane was having a, a difficult time and missed the next tour. And it, the tour was Swan Lake. And Veronica Tennant had had her uh, ACL fixed, and Nadia Potts's back leg wasn't working. I did them all. I did 17 on a, on a Western tour. So I was on like every, every place we went. Super Swan again. <laughs> so that's how I got my name, Super Swan. And, and I've always felt very close to it. And the other thing I did eventually was a thing, a thing called the Dying Swan. And that's different than Swan Lake. It's uh, by Saint-Saëns. It was done by Pavlova. And uh, Pokin uh, created it. The one I did was a little bit different, but that's fine. Everybody does their own version. There's not a lot to it. Just a lot of fluttering and dying. <laughs> so. <laughs> we do that in class. We do that in class. We, yes, that's true. My exercise class, and we do this every once in a while. <laughs> so, um, we're going to have some questions. Uh, if, oh, all right. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is, okay, I don't want to upset anybody. It's my Me Too story on stage, okay? Okay. This is at the Met again. This will finish this get into the other stuff. And I'll talk about how shoes are made as well in a minute. In Sleeping Beauty, has everybody seen it? Everybody knows the story. The princess falls asleep for a hundred years. The prince comes in, gives her a kiss, and she wakes up and falls in love, and they live happily ever after. Well, this, this is it's called the awakening scene, and I'm on the bed in my tutu with all my friends around the bed, all my friends from my 16th birthday party who all fell asleep and Rudolph would have to run across the stage in the dark up some stairs because he couldn't go around because there were no there were no stairs on the back of the stairs there was only stairs on the front of the stairs so he had to run all the way across up the stairs and turn around it looked like he just appeared at the top of the stairs got it got the picture Lying there, I can hear pitter patter, pitter patter, and I hear a noise. And what happened was the lights came up too soon, and they caught him running up the stairs. <laughs> oh boy, was he mad! So he turned around, and he's. Oh, you can hear. Never, I won't say the words. 
And he comes down and he's pulling people's heads and doing this and coming down. And my friends around me are saying, Vanessa, he's really mad. <laughs> he's really mad. I, I said, nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I'm lying there like this. And the music's going and he's, I can hear things going on around me. And all of a sudden he puts his arm underneath. He usually just leans over, gives me a peck on the mouth like a little like that, and then I wake up. Picks me up, and he goes like this, and he kisses me, and he kisses me, and he kisses me, and he kisses me. <laughs> My feet are going <laughs> I wake up and I go, oh my God, ooh, 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 oh, sorry. I keep forgetting I'm in a church. Oh. Anyway. And I run over, and my parents are asleep. It's the king and queen are my parents, don't forget. And I sort of wake them up, and I, I'm supposed to say, over there, somebody with a beautiful face kissed me. Have you seen him? And I went over, and I went, <laughs> I ran over, and I find him over in the corner. I go, oh, I found you. And he looks at me, and he says, how did you like that? <laughs> And I said, not bad. <laughs> so we went over, we did the end, we do our ending, everybody throws roses at us. And then a stagehand came up to him and said, that was quite a kiss. And he said, yes, if I hadn't kissed her, I would have killed her. <laughs> anyway, that's so. So uh, we're going to do questions. And the other thing we're going to do we're going to have a little video that we've got our fingers crossed that we can make it work. So, if there were any pictures up there that you wanted to ask questions about, I didn't want to relate to them in particular, but if, shall we do questions? Or, uh, I was gonna show, sorry, my leg isn't working very well. Point shoes, it was one, one more lesson. They're not made of wood. They're, these aren't too noisy. They've been worn 30 years ago. Uh, they're made out of um, canvas and glue, layer by layer. And then they're shaped. And then they bake them. And then they hammer the toe like that. And then I've cut them off so it's not slippery. But, uh, but they're made to measure, to me, the size of the, what the vamp is, the height here, the height at the back, kind of, I would take my soul out. That sounds funny to say out here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then bend it, and then, so that they're flexible. And then, if you find a pair of shoes that you like, we put uh, shellac in them. And some people bake them in the oven or just let them harden overnight and then you can use them again. Because they're very expensive. They're like over $100 a pair. And we would go through um, between two and certainly two pairs a week when we're rehearsing and two or three pairs in a performance. And every uh, performance requires a different kind of shoe. So some need harder shoes, some need softer shoes. Sometimes you want to be very quiet, and sometimes it doesn't matter if you make a little bit of noise because you need a harder shoe. Sometimes you need a shoe that will last the whole show. Sometimes you need three different, uh, you need three different levels of shoe or two different levels of shoe in each act so that you would change your shoes at each uh, intermission. So it depends on the ballet. For instance, the first act of Swan Lake is a softer shoe. The Black Swan Act, which you, you did see a picture from Black Swan, and you need harder shoes, uh, that would be a newer pair to start, and then that pair would take you through to the end of the ballet. Question, yes?
Yes. You are, no, you actually are on the tip of your toe. Um, everybody does it a little bit differently, but uh, you can see they're very small. So your foot goes in there, nothing moves when it goes in. So when you stand, you, 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 you're, if you did it even with your finger, you can see that I'm right on, my, on the top of my toe. And everybody has different problems. My toes are shaped in a, I don't know, like a V almost. My big toe is longer than my other toes, so I would get bunions. Some dancers have toes that go straight across, and they're square. They get corns because the bones rub together. So everybody would get different problems from the different shape of their foot. And I would get, I had my uh, both uh, big toenails cut out twice because infection and ingrown. And that's because, and I had to dance on an infected toe once. That was painful. That hurt. And the other time it hurt was I tore the meniscus in my bottom rib and I had to dance that night and it was they had to lift me and I, I had tears just rolling down my face from the pain but I had to dance because there was nobody else so that was when I was on tour with Alexander Goodenough so there were there were no extra dancers that was it we had to do what we had to do yes Uh, yeah, um, I, had, I didn't get one during a performance, but I, I had um, tendonitis in my, in my ankle, and I got um, cortisone shots in it, and that really helped it a lot. And I should have had the shot a lot earlier because then I was able to keep going. Um, but yes, that's happened. People have had shots to keep them going. I mean, it, it depends on, you know, when you're in a performance, unless it's really, 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 really bad, like, and it can be really, really, really bad, then they would either, they bring the curtain down. And it happened also in um, Ontario Place once. My partner, he, 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 he threw his knee out, and they had to just stop the performance for a while while they got an ambulance for him and took him to the hospital. I mean, he arrived at the hospital, you can imagine, in full makeup, you know, <laughs> slate pants, bare chest, but, you know, but it was serious. He was off for almost a year with that. So in, uh, injuries are a, 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 good, a good thing to talk about. There's three levels, I say. There's the level where, ouch, it hurts, but I can keep going. Number two, if I keep going, I could, I could injure myself again. And number three, where you can't. And so you have to decide, and there's different ways of deciding what level of injury you've got. And, you know, and pain just doesn't count as a rule. Like if you've got pain, in our day, we didn't even have Advil. Gosh. Good to say gosh. Um, <coughs> we had Alka-Seltzer. Well, Alka-Seltzer is aspirin. So, and it's fizzy, so it would go to your system quicker, go through your stomach, and it would go to your, and that, that eased the pain a bit. Yeah, because it was like an aspirin. What was your diet? My diet? Your diet, yeah. Oh, well, that, well as, uh, as a friend of mine said when I was a dancer, I gave you three shrimp and a piece of apple, and she said, that was a full meal for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had to eat well, because otherwise you don't have the, the strength, right? But you can't eat the things if... If we were pushing our cart in New York, we used to, you know, buy our groceries at the little gestides or what it was called. And if Celia Franca came along, who was our artistic director, and saw cookies in our cart, she'd say, cookies? <laughs> so we, we, we were on a bit of a guilt trip with those kinds of things. And the weight for me was a problem earlier on. She was very difficult with me and 
and I did get thin at one point, and I was, had been thin for like 10 years, and she came up to me, and I was like 29, or something. oh, Dolly, you look so thin. I said, I've been thin for 10 years. <laughs> As you go through your career, you're putting your body under tremendous stress for 20, 25, 30 years. How does that manifest itself later in life? Well, it's weird because all my ballerina friends, uh, they've all had their hips replaced now, and I, I haven't yet, but this one bothers me, and it's bothering me right now a bit. It's doing funny things. But um, Karen Kane and I are the only ones that haven't had our hips replaced yet. Yet, I guess is the word, I guess, operative word. But um, different dancers have different problems, obviously, and, they, and it does take its toll. Uh, I actually am quite lucky, and one of the reasons I'm lucky is I was told I have very long muscles, so they don't bunch up and tear, and I, you know. So from that point of view, I was lucky. I had the right kind of muscle. All the feet. Yeah, my left foot right now is, um, I think there's something's happening to the tendons in the bottom, and, they, and every once in a while I'll be walking. I was at the museum, the art gallery, and my, I was in such agony in my left foot, I'd take my shoes off and massage my feet right there. <laughs> right in the, I had to, I couldn't walk otherwise. So it, it comes and goes, and we live with it. Yes. Yes. Well, part of, like I said earlier, part of a dancer's life is, is there's a few things. There's how they survive it themselves and their bodies and how they adjust. And then depending on what kind of dance they do, I, I am so surprised that the dancers of today go as long as they do because I, I call it uh, pretzel ballets, you know, that they... They're like, you know, and I would don't think I'd ever been able to do pretzel ballets, you know. It's and so it's hard to know how long. They, everybody's an individual. Oh, now and, yes. And the the what you think about the national ballet and its future and. Yeah, the question is, what, what am I, what, how am I involved with the National Ballet now, and what do I think of them now, right? First of all, I'll, I'll just say that I think Karen Kane, who is the artistic director, has done a fantastic job of the National Ballet. She's brought class to it. She uh, she's, knows all the people all over the world, so choreographers will come in for her and give her ballets, and so I think she's done a great job. I think the dancers are great, and they're doing new stuff all the time. But um, my involvement right now is as Patrons Council Committee, and I do two things with that. I uh, thank people for giving money, <laughs> which is fine. And the other thing I do is, I don't know if people go to the ballet, but there's a uh, a lounge for the patrons so they can hang their coats and have a glass of wine and then I'll go to a ballet and I'll talk to the patrons and if they have questions I'll answer questions or you know or, or whatever so so I am involved and it gives me a chance to see the dancers of today and I love them I love the dancers of today I think they're absolutely wonderful I really do Oh yes, and Guillaume Cote is um, he's the you know the principal star dancer, male dancer in the National Ballet, but he's also a choreographer as well. And uh, I just turn off. I'm still on. There we go. There we go. He uh, graduated from the National Ballet School, and then he became an apprentice. They didn't have apprentices in my day. They, we, we just danced, and that was it. I, don't, I doubt if they even paid. But um, 
when you're apprentice, you don't you only earn a bit of money usually when you perform. So they he couldn't afford to live because he was from Quebec. So we took him in, and uh, he lived in our basement. <laughs> Nothing like a good basement, right? And so we had him for a year, and then he joined the ballet company at the end of that season, and then of course he was fine. And now he's huge, you know. So and he's married. They have two children. Uh, it was very difficult to have children in my day because because of the touring. Uh, or even the dancers before my and um, now it's a little bit easier for them because they're home more. So it's wonderful that they have now. Yes, Sally. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> um, you know, in our fitness class, how we work on our arms all the time. Well, you and our, our class has been privileged to have you show us the Swan Lake arms. And I wondered if you would honor the audience by showing your Swan Lake arms. <laughs> oh, okay. On that note. Yes. See, I don't have to do it. You'll see. You'll see. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to watch a short little video. It will answer Sally's question. And afterwards. The tutus are here, the pointers are here, the cards are over there, and the wine is over there. Okay. <laughs> we got our fingers crossed. I couldn't get this to work yesterday, no matter how hard we tried.
beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa, very much for your time. Okay. You're, you're we welcome. appreciate that. And any questions? Very much. Sir? And uh, that was done by, uh, oh, you'll see Elizabeth Lewis, and it was animation. And, and it was all in slow motion, which is kind of weird, but anyway. Before we leave, we'd like to have Charlotte come up. Oh. All ballerinas get flowers at the end of their performance. <laughs> We couldn't let her go home without flowers. Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> oh, my favorite. We, I think we need Eckhart. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I hope you enjoyed it.